Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, because of your tender love toward us sinners, you have given us your Son, that believing in him we might have eternal life. Continue to grant us your Spirit, that we may remain steadfast in this faith to the end, and finally come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah 53. Who has believed what they heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, 
so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from 1 Peter chapter 2. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is found in Mark chapter 15. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama spaktani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
In the name of Jesus, amen. Who is Jesus? He is the suffering servant who saved us by dying on a cross. But how? How does that work? Why is it that this man's death means my salvation? Well, in the entire Bible, there's probably no better explanation than our reading from Isaiah 53. Why does the cross save? Because this man who had no sin was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was placed the chastisement that brings us peace. And by his stripes we are healed. For we, like sheep, we had all gone astray. Each had turned to his own way. So the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. That's how salvation works. It's a blessed exchange between us and Jesus. Jesus takes my sin and he gives me righteousness. He takes my guilt. He gives me his innocence. He takes my curse. He gives me his blessing. He takes my death. He gives me life. The cross and the grave that I deserve, he takes them all. And in exchange, he gives me the eternal life that only he deserves. What a good deal, at least for me, but not for him. Why would he do this? What would cause him to do such a thing? The only answer is love. First, the love of the Father, who so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. And the love of the Son, who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's why we're saved. So Isaiah 53 reveals what the cross does. But in so doing, it also reveals something about us. For it reveals what we had deserved. It reveals the punishment that should have been ours had he not taken our place. If it's true that he died for me, well, wait, that means that the cross should have been mine. That's hard for most of us to fathom because most of us, by nature, we consider, us, consider ourselves good people. But what do the commandments say? According to the ninth and 10th commandments, we are charged with the crime of coveting. For we are grumblers, malcontents, who fail to thank God for his countless blessings. According to the eighth commandment, we discover we're gossips. We don't build each other up, we tear each other down, complaining about each other, often behind the other person's back. And we are quick to assign evil motives to others. How ironic. The seventh commandment calls each of us a thief. Not me, we say. But we have all failed in generosity. We are all selfish creatures who hoard time and treasure, always worried that we might not have enough for ourselves. The sixth commandment calls us adulterers. Jesus says, if you've looked at another lustfully, you've already committed adultery. The fifth commandment calls us murderers. Jesus says, if you call your brother an idiot, you've already committed murder. The fourth commandment, oh, how we love to quote it when we are the authority. But we hate to follow it. The third commandment demands that we hear the word of God gladly, 
But what do we do? We get distracted. We say we're too busy, or we find it a bore. The second commandment tells us to call upon God's name, to pray. But our prayer life has faltered. And above all else, there's the first commandment that says we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, with every fiber of our being. But our hearts go after anything other than God. Even trivial things like Netflix, social media, sports, hobbies, video games. We are willing to invest ourselves in just about anything other than God. So, my friend, we are horrible sinners. We are criminals with countless and daily crimes. And death is the only remedy. That's what Isaiah 53 reveals. And if you don't think so, perhaps this analogy will help. Imagine you're an inventor, and you invent a bunch of robots to take care of your property. You have robots that will protect the property, that will cook your food, that will teach your children, that will feed your pets, that will mow the lawn and do the dishes. Wouldn't that be nice? But then imagine you wake up one morning and the robots have gone haywire. The one you designed to do the dishes is throwing dishes at your children. And the one who should cook the food is setting the house on fire. And the one that should mow the lawn is trying to mow down your cat. And the one that should protect your property is trying to kill you. If the robots are all broken and they no longer work according to design, what's the reasonable thing to do? Shut them down. Destroy them. Why keep them around if they're just hurting your property and messing everything up? Well, likewise, what do we humans deserve if we break every commandment that he's ever given us? And we don't stop. The reasonable thing to do would be to destroy us. It's not only reasonable, it's just. For that's what we deserve. Indeed, if I were God, the Bible would be very short. Chapter 1 and 2, God creates the world. Chapter 3, it falls into sin. Chapter 4, God annihilates those ingrates. The end. But in love, the real God is different. And he does something marvelous. He's patient. He waits for thousands of years, bearing with these sinners. And he loves them. He loves them even while they're ruining everything. And then when the fullness of time had come, He sends forth his son, born under woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law by dying in their place. This is what the Father does. He sends us his only son. And the Father takes all the sins of every crime you have ever committed against the commandments. He takes all the debt that you owe for all the ways you ruin the world with selfishness. And instead of making you pay, he lays it all on his son. And it's this that redeems us and forgives us and transforms us. This passage from Isaiah 53 reveals that the cross is what should have been done to me and you. But instead, God has transferred all of our guilt onto another. And now, because of him, our debt has been paid in full. And we are free to live as the children of God. Jesus is 
the servant who in obedience to the Father suffered for you. For you, he was despised and rejected. For you, sorrowful and acquainted with grief. For you, he was marred beyond appearance. For you, stricken, smitten, and afflicted. For you, wounded. For you, crushed. For you, chastised to bring about peace. For you, he bears the iniquity of all, judged, oppressed, and he was cut off from the land of the living for you. Who is Jesus? He is the one who suffers in obedience to God for you. Why? Because of love. Because he doesn't want to destroy you. Because he wants you to live. Finally, I want to point out just one more thing. In verse 4 of Isaiah 53, in verse 4, it says, Surely he has bore our griefs. That word griefs in Hebrew can mean sicknesses or diseases. And with this virus going around, I think it's a good image to leave with you. For Jesus has taken our diseases into himself. Just imagine for a moment that after COVID-19, a new disease comes along that's much worse. And imagine that this new disease infects everyone on the planet and it's going to be fatal for everyone. Just imagine how hopeless we would all be. Imagine the chaos that would ensue in the world. But then imagine that one person has a superhero power, and he figures out that he can suck the disease out of other people and into himself. And each time he does it, he gets sicker and sicker. But this one man chooses to pull the disease out of everyone else, and then he dies so that everyone else can live. Imagine how much humanity would celebrate that man. Imagine the praise we would all have for a man who only extended our earthly life for a while. Well, my friends, Jesus has done just that and far more for you. Because he doesn't only take our death, he takes away hell as well. And he grants us resurrection and life unto the ages. Why would he serve us in this way? How could he possibly love us sinners? I don't know. But I know this. We will forever praise him as the suffering servant. In eternity, we will sing praises to the one who bore our diseases and was crucified for us. For he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. To him be glory forever. Amen. Normally at this time, we would be collecting our offerings. We ask that you'd remember the ministry of St. John during this time, and that you would continue to give as you are able, whether that's mailing in your offering or signing up online for automatic giving. Please see the email that was sent to you last week. We continue with the prayers.
Gracious Father, in love you sent your Son to bear our sin and to be our Savior. Grant to all a repentant joy that turning from sin we may rejoice in your forgiveness found in the cross of Christ. We thank you that in love you chose not to destroy us, but to redeem us and to gather us through holy baptism into your one church, adopting us as your children, even though we had been your enemies. Father, grant us your Holy Spirit that we may be ever mindful of this salvation. Help us to know who Jesus is. For this is your will, that everyone should look on the Son and believe in him and have eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>